This is a collaborative event. There are many sponsors. I hope you notice some of them on the screen. The Reynolds Journalism Institute and Journalism School. Collaborating with the Life Sciences is a um, mold-breaking event that has not happened much before. Uh, we have a lot of support from Mizzou Advantage that is in the business of supporting uh, transdisciplinary activities, and we're very grateful for all that. And to all the deans who contributed, as well as Ragtag Cinema and uh, some other community participants. So. Uh, we're here to talk about science today, um, and I'm going to pass the torch here to uh, our Chancellor, Bowen Lofton, who will carry forward. Chancellor Lofton. Good morning, and M-I-Z. See, you can do it. Welcome to Jesse Hall and to an extraordinary morning here at the University of Missouri. Uh, I've known about Bill Nye for a long time. I've, I somehow feel a strong affinity for him. Uh, it may be the fact I'm tall like he is. I have a lot of hair like he has. What can it be? Uh, seriously, uh, this symposium is a fantastic opportunity for all of us to look at how the sciences in general, but life sciences in particular, impact our lives. Uh, we all know that over the last many decades, the life sciences have had a profound impact on us, and the future is going to be certainly even more so. Uh, we are discovering things today about the human genome, about the genomes of plants and animals that will allow us to do things we could even have imagined a few years ago. So what better time is there to for us to be here together talking about uh, the communication of science. And I really appreciated Rebecca Sklut coming here earlier. Who was here for her talk? <laughs> Rebecca did a wonderful job tracing her trajectory from being a pre-vet student to what she is today, a premier science communicator. And I felt that was a wonderful thing for this campus given our focus here on the sciences but also our focus on something else, journalism. And so what a great way for us then to bring uh, Bill Nye here to kind of bookend this whole week and talk to us about his world, uh, how he communicates science. I've had the fortune in my life to many times be able to talk to small children, up to those who act like children but are much older, <laughs> about science and, and use their curiosity to engage them and keep them interested in this great enterprise. So it's my pleasure today to welcome all of you to Jesse Hall for this wonderful moment. Uh, please enjoy it with me. I'm Hank Foley. Uh, I'm Executive Vice President here at the System. I'm also Senior Vice Chancellor for Research uh, at Mizzou, and I couldn't be prouder of what we're doing here this morning. So I wear a lot of hats, but probably my, uh, my favorite hat is uh, that of being a scientist, a teacher, and a researcher. And so with that in mind, I'm really glad to see uh, so many young people in the crowd today because I'm so hopeful that a day like this will inspire you to follow the same kind of path that I decided to follow so many years ago and have enjoyed so thoroughly. Uh, this conference that we've had this week on decoding science has just been terrific. It's done a great job of focusing conversations around science, um, focusing on us uh, and, and trying to help us as scientists figure out how to communicate better, how to talk about science with people who are non-scientists, and sort of rekindle the sort of excitement and vigor for science that uh, was so true in this country when Bill Nye and I were kids and, and young people. We had a great conversation about that this morning and how uh, the moonshot really just motivated, and Sputnik just motivated so many of us uh, to want to go into math, science, and engineering. We're doing everything we can, I think, to uh, recultivate that kind of excitement. And there's probably no one more premier at that uh, than Bill Nye. In fact, he looks for his legacy to be you guys, you guys going into science and engineering. Now, for those of you who are over 50 or 60, it's not too late. I don't want to be age discriminatory here. But Tim, yeah, there's still time for you and, and others. Uh, we're, we're open to anyone who wants to come into the field, really. 
So Bill really understands all this better than anyone. Uh, trained as a, as a mechanical engineer, uh, but mechanical engineers have to learn so much science and math uh, to do their jobs. Uh, he'll have a few things I'm sure to say about that, but in the ensuing years, he's really become iconic. He is the guy, the guy who really knows how to decode science and excite young people. He's brought coolness to science. Uh, he's gotten kids excited, am I right? Are there some young people out there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the, uh, the warm-up back for the Rolling Stones here. This is great. <laughs> and, and, uh, and he continues to become even better at it as the years go by. Uh, there's a real need for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math in this country. I'm really proud of what we're doing here in Missouri to try to enhance that and to get as many of you who have an inclination to go into STEM disciplines to do so. And, uh, and I hope many of you will. And I think today, Bill, with all the things he's going to talk about and our other speakers, uh, will incentivize you to do that. Uh, it's also notable that uh, Bill is not just cool in the sciences, but a few of you may have noticed that he can, uh, what's it called, flip the light fandango. He was uh, on Dancing with the Stars. And uh, <clears throat> although he had an injury, which made his presence on the show a little short-lived, I think we could all see that a scientist could really bust a move if it was required and, and, do it, and do it very well. So I know we're all in for a great treat today in listening to Bill Nye, the science guy. Enjoy. Bill, welcome to Mizzou. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Greetings. Woo. Good morning, peoples. Wow, wow, wow. Greetings, greetings, greetings. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, kids of all ages. No, it's great to see you. Good morning, good morning. I was, um, I was really excited about this uh, talk till, uh, till just a couple minutes ago. <laughs> and, well, I mean, somebody came up to me and said, is Bill Nye your real name? And I said, well, it's William Nye. And he said, well, why did you change it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hi. So, Bill, a little something for you to yes. come to zoo with. Uh, I open this? Yes. It's going to, they're safe? I'll stay <laughs> Oh, cool. Oh, look at this, everybody. Come on. <laughs> yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see what we got here. Let's see. For those of you unfamiliar with bow ties, you have to uh, adjust their length, the length of each one, that is to say. Uh, if I can, I'm just working with my pronouns there. I'm on stage. I'm under pressure. <laughs> I think it's going to have enough twang in it. I'm going to leave it right there. Stand by. Um, you know, it has, uh, bow ties are inherently, um, well, let me say normally, cut on the bias. But this is kind of a, huh, we'll see. <laughs> Anybody know what cutting on the bias is? Anybody? Right on. Let me rephrase it. Anybody under 20 know what cutting on the bias is? <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's a woman. Uh, my mother taught me how to sew, teach a man to fish, teach a man to sew and he'll uh, be able to put buttons on the rest of his life. Got some wiring here. Okay. So you guys, I don't think you can see in this situation, but it has little maps of Missouri on it. I know, it's the cutest. <laughs> And another thing, guys, you want it to come out right side up if there's a pattern on it. So I think we got it. All right. Okay, what, 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 where were we? Yes, hi. How does it look? We good? All right. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Cool. 
Now, where was I? Yes, hold it, everybody, in their excitement. I can tell people have been putting things down on the... There we are. Yes. Greetings, tigers. Woo! Greetings. Now, let's get started. Yeah. So, um, this is the earth. Actually, um, it's a picture of the earth. The earth... Um, I don't think it would even fit in this room, tell you the truth, <laughs> if you had the whole earth. But when you look at that picture, do you see that you don't even see the atmosphere? The atmosphere is not even there in that picture. You have to get quite a bit closer to even notice it. Uh, this is the space station. Oh, actually, picture of a space station. It's in space, not, not in Missouri. And uh, in this picture, it almost looks like the, the earth is out of focus because the atmosphere is so extraordinarily thin. And it is this thin atmosphere that is gonna be your biggest challenge. Uh, whether you're a student here now or a grown-up paying taxes and so on, we're all grown-ups, sort of, uh, we're paying taxes, this is gonna be the biggest problem. So for me, our story begins back in 1964 when my family took me to the World's Fair in New York City. The towns are not, yes, way to go. World's Fair, New York City, it gets applause. <laughs> like, what, did you run it or something? What, what? <laughs> the town's so nice, they named it twice. It's visionary, the globe there is still there. It's made of stainless steel, hasn't rusted. And it was a big, exciting thing. Uh, I was with uh, my brother, sister, my parents, and my father understand, I mean, I'm eccentric enough, but uh, my father will drive along, take pictures of the car's odometer as it changed from 99,999 uh, to 100,000 miles. And the cop pulls him over and wants to know what he's doing. I'm taking pictures of the odometer. Sir, it's a highway, you know, please. <laughs> but we, they had there a total board of the world's population. And my parents and, uh, and I missed it just changing. We were a couple hours behind. It changing from 2,999,999,999 people in the world to 3 billion people in the world. All right, in my lifetime, since 1964, the world's population as of this morning, I captured this number this morning, is well over 7 billion, seven, almost 7.2 billion people. It's more than doubled in my lifetime. That is the problem. Much as I love people, there are a lot of them. And, uh, and we, everybody, if you go to the developed, developing world, everybody wants to live the way we live in the developed world. Everybody wants phones. I mean, this plane is missing, right? Which is... Uh, a bad thing. Malaysia Airlines 370 is missing. And you'll meet many people. I can't understand this. Don't they have Twitter? Where are those people? Where's Facebook? What's going on? Well, when you're in some parts of the world, there's not, they're just, it isn't there. But everybody in those parts of the world wants it to be there. And, you know, you can go to Western China and meet people who have never made a phone call, not never made a cell phone call, never made a phone call. And these people want to live the way we live in the developed world. They want to drive cars, they want computers, they want all the fabulous fast food and so on. And uh, this is putting stress on the Earth's environment. So you may be familiar with this graph. This is uh, the graph of the world's temperature over the last thousand years, compiled nominally by Michael Mann, who's now at Penn State. He had to leave the Commonwealth of Virginia because the Commonwealth of Virginia Attorney General was suing him for studying the Earth's climate with company uh, state tax dollars. And this is the famous hockey stick. So this uh, a brown line represents the shaft of a hockey stick. And so the world's temperature has been about the same the last thousand years, but the last 250 years the world's temperature has gotten uh, warmer very fast. So everybody, it's not that the world is getting warmer. 
It's not that the world may have been warmer some other time. It's the speed. It's the rate that the world is getting warmer. That is the hassle. So by the way, full disclosure, Michael Mann's book just came out in paperback. And uh, full disclosure, I wrote the, uh, the foreword. So are there any professors here? Yeah, I just want to point out, okay, if you have a laser pointer and you go like this, it doesn't help anybody, okay? This is not, this is not like, you think you're up there, you're really passionate, you're going like that. People, dude, what? Yeah. So. Michael Mann and his colleagues, as you may know, took the same information, the same uh, way of determining the Earth's climate, nominally with, I mean, mainly with ice cores, but also with the rings in trees. In warmer seasons, the rings, the trees grow faster, the rings are farther apart. Pollen in the sediments of lakes and ponds, and so on. And we've taken it back now 10,000 years. And so this little brown line up here this one right here is the shaft of the hockey stick from the previous graph, and now we have this uh, going back 10,000 years, and it was warmer, there was more carbon dioxide, but now they call it the sickle instead of the hockey stick because it's going up so fast. That's the problem. It's not that it's been warmer or colder or anything, or it's been going on, uh, it's, it's been going on for millennia, but now it's happening so fast. So I just want to point out that I go way back with this. Uh, I wrote my first kid's book uh, back in 1993. Yes, it was when, um, 1993 was when Nirvana's uh, first album, I guess. Is that right, 93? Uh, and so in this book, this, this guy looks just like me, only sort of half my age. <laughs> and uh, I had this proposal where you would take time and, and do your own uh, carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's a model, but it's not, the atmosphere is not pure carbon dioxide. You would notice that right away, let me tell you. <gasps> that would be very clear. Uh, and then a couple years ago, I did a very similar ex demonstration on Stuff Happens. And what I say to everybody, what you want to do <clears throat> is show. You want to show and then tell. And this is very hard to do because what we all want to do is just explain it. Just, just start talking and just get it done. Just, just move on. But my claim is that when you can see it, uh, that's when it becomes compelling. That's when you get it. And then you see it and then you wonder what happened and then somebody, it is to be hoped, will explain it to you. So along this line, this goes back, this, the bottom one goes back to 1993. This one's about 1994. This was um, 2007 and eight, and it's the same message. And people are still having, in the United States especially, are still having a great deal of trouble embracing the idea of climate change. And I get it, I mean, I get it. If you are the senator from Oklahoma, uh, you grew up where your neighbors are literally kilometers or miles away from you. you. It's literally incredible to you that humans could change the population of a whole, uh, the, the climate of a whole planet. The human population could change the climate of a whole planet. It just doesn't seem feasible. But the problem is, it's more than the human population is more than doubled in my lifetime, and the atmosphere is extraordinarily thin. So I've done my best in the last few minutes just to show you those couple images. You know, if you had the right car on some extraordinary road and you could drive straight up for uh, two hours, well, the way people drive in Missouri, about 45 minutes, <laughs> uh, and you'd be in outer space. And so the, the outer space is extraordinarily close to us. And that, that's the problem, the thin atmosphere and 7 billion people going on 12 billion people. And at the same time, here in the United States, what is the main thing we export? The main thing we export in the United States, you could say airplanes, which are cool. They're billions of billion dollar deals all the time. But the main thing we exploit, export is our culture. People all over the world watch U.S. movies, U.S. television. 
to a limited extent that you listen to U.S. podcasts and stuff. But there's a movie coming out called Noah, where this guy from the Bible, who looks just like Russell Crowe, <laughs> runs around and, and uh, the earth is drowned and all the um, significant organisms are saved by getting just two of them on an ark that floats somehow for a year with no windows and everybody else d drowns, you know, cool. And this is, because, this is to atone for some, uh, something we did wrong. And this wouldn't matter except people are going to think that this is what people think. And by that I mean the myth of Noah comes from a society that lived where there were floods. I'm sure. Rivers flooded and so they came up with their fabulous flood myth. Many societies came up with that. You know, more power to them. But that's not factual, I don't think. Not worldwide. And as you may know, <laughs> I got in a little discussion about this. <laughs> wow, I can't get how many people, how many people watch that? That is amazing. Thank you. How many people don't know what we're all just laughing at? Well, right on. Right. So um, this guy who claims he believes the earth is 6,000 years old challenged me to a duel. And I went around for a while and I was able to hone it so that it was whether or not his creation model was viable. That was his, his uh, adjective. And his Ken Ham shown here, there's what's his name over here. And uh, you know, I did what I, what I could to show, not him, I mean, I'm not going to change his mind or his congregation would probably not change their minds. The problem is that these people are running around in what used to be the world's technological leader in this, our society at a time when we have these extraordinary problems that have to be solved. We have these uh, 7 billion people who are going on 12 billion and we have climate change. So we don't want to raise a generation of people that don't accept the process of science, let alone the body of knowledge of science, and, um, and leave the world worse than we found it. So this is an example from a dear friend of mine, Don Prothero. Now, if you're in the audience and you can understand this, I don't know who you are. So if you're a professor here and you got this, all you got to do is a very newer version of Philip Henry's God's Theory of 1857. God's can believe that. Is, well, what the what? So apparently to some people who are creationists, one of the ch great challenges is um, Adam and Eve, uh, who are from the Bible, are supposed to, uh, did they have belly buttons? This is, you know, a deep question for some people, for some people. So he has all these words and then he brings this picture in and you'll see, yeah, they, yeah, I know, they have no um, genitalia, but they do have belly buttons. So, uh, yeah, I know it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's, you're probably never gonna meet anybody like that. So, <laughs> my point being, that the guy presenting this, in my opinion, there's, two, there's more than you can absorb. It's, it's more than you can get if you're sitting in the audience. And you can argue, well, these are college students, they're supposed to be able to read. But they can't read while you're talking, in my opinion. And so it's my claim that many of my scientific colleagues, if I can be a scientist as well as an engineer, uh, do this a lot where you present all this information which you strongly believe is proof of whatever it is you're trying, the point you're trying to make. But it's more than the listener or observer or a classroom person can get. So I took the liberty of taking this map from Ken Ham's website. And it just, you're not going to find that many maps, everybody, that depict England, call attention to England and Utah <laughs> on the same map. <laughs> I mean, it might happen, I mean, no, really, it's just, and not, you know, you'll notice there's still this thing going on, Scotland doesn't get anything, you know, or Wales, no, Britain, it's not the UK, no, it's England, and then it's not the American West or the Great Basin or the Frontage Range or the Benchlands, no, it's Utah itself, okay. 
So I pointed out to Mr. Ham and his audience, and Mr. Ham, of course, isn't going to, it's not going to do anything for him, but the people like you who are watching on the TV, the computer machine that the kids use, uh, I pointed out that if, if this ark had landed at, on Mount Ararat, uh, you would expect to find kangaroo fossils or kangaroos in Vietnam or Laos or someplace, but there aren't any. And so uh, this to me would be enough to like turn the whole thing on its head. And I'm hoping that as the years go on and people watch that video enough, that eventually the United States, the world's leader in technology and science, will discard this and not um, let this be the image we present to the world. So, uh, oh, thank you. Oh, good. I love you guys, it's so great. So another, another remarkable thing, which can be troubling or empowering, is uh, this discovery of how many ancestors we modern humans have. It really is amazing. But what would you, go, yeah, what would you guys be doing if you weren't here? That's right, you'd be watching CSI Columbia or something. <laughs> Did they have that yet? Did, do they have that? They have St. Louis now, and so it's pretty soon they're going to have one just for, yeah, downtown, just for the one. <laughs> so uh, this one I like, uh, Demand CS2 is pretty good. Uh, does anybody know where we are? We're down here at the bottom. And then this one with the really small brain case here, that's, uh, I think that's my old boss, I think, <laughs> right there. And I know this this presentation affected people because somebody went out of their way in the rain to put this on their, on their Dodge Caravan. I know, I know. So somehow I am lying about all this and everything's fine. Just take my word for it. I mean, it's just, it would be okay. But this is a family vehicle. I'm not kidding, and I think there's probably a family with young people in there who are gonna be brought up with this extraordinary view of the world, and they will not be successful scientists and engineers. And as I like to point out, there are billions of people in the world who are deeply religious and embrace it, and they get great sense of community and wonder from their affiliation with uh, whatever religious branch of religion they're into. But the earth is not 6,000 years old, <laughs> just can't be. And so we just can't let this idea, uh, so thank you. We can't let this idea get too far out there. So uh, by the way, everybody, in the US Constitution is, to, is the charge to the US Congress to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. So I can, I'm an engineer and you can, you can probably tell. Uh, you'll usually recognize us at parties. Because, <laughs> you know, pants don't reach the floor. And... But still, they still want you at the party. That's the thing. <laughs> hey, you're an engineer. Hey, man, um, <clears throat> can you fix the blender? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so tell you what, um, sure, uh, get the plug, hold, hold it in the wall firmly, and then put the blender under some cold running water. Let's see what... <laughs> see, that's only funny if you're scientifically literate. See, that's only hilarious. Oh, for some reason I threw this in here. I, uh, I guess it's because I was talking about engineering and presentation of information. I will say that right here, I used this one, the, the main boat drawing is from that, web, from that guy's website, uh, and he's got Noah's Ark there uh, with some other wooden ships that were built. The detail he left out about the, U, about the Wyoming six-masted wooden vessel is it sank. <laughs> it's kind of, it's an important detail. Uh, because it twisted, and apparently it's very difficult to build uh, lumber, wooden lumber ships that uh, hold together. And all 14 crewmen were lost at sea, miserable. 
But the premise of the bit is that he was going to have 14,000 animals all running around safely for a year. You know, I mean, I'm open-minded, of course, but it just didn't happen. And so I will say that this, this graphic is a little too busy. If you're watching on a website, you can get it. If you're there trying to make a point, maybe you can get it. But I think there's a little too much going on. So uh, let's say instead that this uh, picture of the sun represents uh, the sun. <laughs> and then uh, this will represent the earth and it's one astronomical unit, one AU from the sun. Now that's an average. An AU is a very easy thing to remember. You go up to an astronomer and you go, AU. <laughs> How far is the earth from the sun? And then he or she will say, one AU. And then see, you've, there you go. It's uh, 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles. Then let's say um, this is the, uh, this picture of Mercury represents Mercury. It's 40% of the distance, 0.4 AU. Then Venus is 0.7 AU. And Mars is 1.5 AU uh, it, on an average. And so these sm relatively small changes in this one number uh, affect everyone on Earth. Now, if those of you, I see a lot of young people in the audience, you'll remember it easily. Some of the older people, I hope you'll reach back and remember playing this game where you can't step on the floor <laughs> because it's like lava. <laughs> and then you can't drink out of the sink because that's like acid <laughs> and will kill you. Well, let me tell you something. <clears throat> on Venus, it's really like that. <laughs> On Venus, it's 90,000 atmosphere, uh, 90 atmospheres, 90,000 hectopascals, or heps. And a hectopascal is the same unit as a millibar for the older people. It's the system international version. Hectopascal. <laughs> So this was taken by a Russian Venera spacecraft, which survived on the surface of Venus for a little less than an hour, but long enough to send back these, this picture. It's amazing. So if you were there on the surface of Venus, and you had your fishing weights, let's say, or your old-fashioned uh, toy soldiers, they would melt. It's hot enough to melt lead. But wait, wait, there's more. Uh, the clouds of Venus are literally sulfuric acid. Like, dude, what? Yeah, there's sulfuric acid. It rains sulfuric acid on Venus. But the rain doesn't make it to the ground because the ground is so hot, the rain evaporates before it gets to the surface. It's this extraordinary sulfur acid cycle. By Western standards, Venus is like hell. And we don't want to be like Venus. And at least most of us. And uh, uh, the reason is there's just too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, having uh, an atmosphere that's 90 times the density of the Earth makes it uh, thick, resistant. There is a tidal interaction between the atmosphere of Venus and the spin of Venus. Uh, we have the ocean in the Earth, but our atmosphere isn't that thick. If we go to Mars, which is extraordinarily cold. You know, it's about, uh, on a summer day, it'll be freezing, zero Celsius right at the surface, and here it'll be 20 below, and here it'll be 40 below, because the atmosphere is so crazy thin. Uh, so the atmosphere, as we say, is uh, too thin to help you, but too thick to ignore. And that's why landing on Mars is so difficult. This is a trace of the path of the Curiosity rover over the last few months, taken with pictures from a satellite in orbit around Mars. I mean, you guys, it's really extraordinary to put satellites in orbit around another planet and take pictures of the surface. I mean, if you told my grandfather you were doing it, he'd go, are you drunk? Like, what are you, <laughs> that's not possible. Anyway, when you look at Mars, which has an atmosphere much, much thinner than the Earth's and extraordinarily thinner than the Venusian atmosphere. Oh yeah, um, adjectives that talk about Venus, uh, things that have the characteristics or, or pertain to Venus, the adjective now is Venusian. 
in the 19th century, that adjective was venereal. And so we, we had to uh, change it. Because uh, it was the planet of love, yeah, and so on. But Mars, we say Martian for Mars. If you look at the Martian surface, you can see craters. Like there's one, and uh, there's another one. And, you know, really, if you look not even closely, there's a lot of them. <laughs> there's just a lot of craters. And so those, it is reasonable that the same thing that happened on Mars and the same thing that happens on Venus happens here on Earth. And that's really the essence of science, you guys, is to find natural laws that are true everywhere. So it could be that if Mars has been struck by all these uh, objects and leaving these enormous craters, and it has carbon dioxide, which keeps, its, keeps it that world just a little bit warmer than it would be otherwise. Venus has carbon dioxide that keeps it extraordinarily warmer than it would be otherwise. And we have a little bit of carbon dioxide that keeps us just warm enough. These principles are true everywhere. And so what I want you all to consider, the young people especially, is the chance that the Earth will get hit with an asteroid. And I'm not joking you. So this is uh, Meteor Crater, Arizona. If you've never been there, it is amazing. You get out of your car and you walk up this little hill and you go through these doors and there's a Subway sandwich shop right there. There really is. And you walk along and you come out to there through another set of doors and there's this hole! There's this enormous hole! It's a mile wide. It's... Uh, 200 something meters, 550 feet deep. And it was made by an impactor, we figure about 25,000 years ago. Now, when I was in astronomy class, back in the 1970s, it was when uh, disco was just giving way to, uh, to punk, and the, you know, the important work of uh, Sid Vicious and the Sex Pistols. Uh, this stuff, no, sorry. I've spoken, it's not for me, it's for the kids, it's for the young people. Anyway, my old professor, Carl Sagan, used to talk quite a bit about the Tunguska event. And people didn't really have uh, an especially great explanation for it other than it must have been uh, something that came from the sky and exploded. Well, since then, a lot of work's been done on meteor impacts and so on, meteorite impacts. And apparently, you know, you may have heard this story, if you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, the water will be like concrete and it will kill you. And that's nominally true. Uh, yes, don't do that. Uh, uh, so apparently if you're a rock or a block of ice coming into the Earth's atmosphere, the atmosphere cannot get out of the way fast enough and you just explode. And so when you do, you create this air burst and you knock down trees for 100 kilometers in every direction, which is what happened in Siberia. Now, if you're, by the way, if you're an asteroid and you're coming in to hit the Earth from the north, there's a good chance you'll hit Russia, uh, just to, for your expectations. You might hit Canada, but Russia's 11, it used to be 11 time zones wide. They did some, re, it's now nine time zones, but it's, it's huge. It's most of the northern, uh, the polar region. Anyway, uh, you guys were all here last year when uh, the Chelyabinsk object hit uh, Chelyabinsk, Russia, and exploded in the sky. And there's so much insurance fraud there, everybody has a camera on their dashboard. <laughs> a little weird. But they got uh, dozens and dozens of pictures of this thing streaking through the sky. People go up to the windows looking at the streak. Wow, well, that's cool. Then almost three minutes later, the sonic booms, the shock waves, hit the ground and blow out the windows. A thousand people go to the hospital. Uh, and then that same night, or this, in the course of the next uh, 24 hours, uh, another asteroid came between the Earth and the Global Positioning Satellites, and that one was quite a bit bigger, 2012 DA-14, if you're scoring along with us. And if that had hit anywhere, it would utterly change the world. I mean, it would utterly change the world. I'll claim that asteroid uh, deflection is the only preventable natural disaster. It is the one. And I want you, young people here, to save the world. Uh, yeah, sure, yes, save the world, yes. So it may be, 
This is a fun little science fiction problem for you all. You know, we at the Planetary Society, I'm now, this, see, you guys, Carl Sagan started the Planetary Society back in 1980. And I got on the mailing list because I had gone to school there and I joined and it was big fun. And then um, when Carl Sagan died, I spoke, I was asked to speak at his memorial and that was quite an honor, it was cool. Then I was asked to be on the board of directors. And I did that for several years along with my, seriously, you guys, my very good friend, Neil Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson, yes. He is a dear friend. I mean, we've, we've knocked a few back. I mean, it's been really good. Um, anyway, then uh, something happened. I left the room or something, or maybe there was wine. And now, now I'm the CEO of the Planetary Society. Although I'm just not really clear on what happened. But we promote this idea because it's a real thing. Now, this is, here's a fun little science, science fiction thing for you to consider. Maybe the reason we have never heard from another civilization, the planetary side still listens for a search for extraterrestrial intelligence, an extraterrestrial signal. Uh, maybe the reason we've never heard from anybody is you have to pass the asteroid test. Maybe you have to have two superpowers who are fighting it out, and then you have to have a moon. And you said, I'll race you to the moon, okay. And then you go to the moon and you mess around and you end up with a space program. And then when you find an asteroid with your name on it, you can go out there and just give it a little push. And if you don't have the two superpowers and the moon, then you don't get it done. Mrs. McGonagall, my second grade teacher, uh, read to us from a book. And this is a book that, if I may, the man gave her to read. And, and dinosaurs died out because they had small brains. So the mammals took all their food and they died. <laughs> and even she knew that was just lame. Come on. I'm, I'm a Tyrannosaurus. You are a rabbit. There. I mean, you know, but in my lifetime, we found this crater off Chicxulub, Mexico that is almost certainly evidence of the asteroid impact which killed the ancient dinosaurs or contributed to their demise, certainly. So we do not want to go the route of the ancient dinosaurs. So you'd say, what do you do? Run in circles screaming? No. Do you send Bruce Willis? No. <laughs> I love the guy, but no, because you don't want to blow it up because then you're gonna have a shower of these objects and you may, with, you know, in outer space things are complicated, you may make a few of them hit even sooner or harder or worse. So you might go out there and park your spaceship on the asteroid and then turn on the rocket engine, you know. Because you wanna give it a nudge, just a little nudge. But it's in outer space so there's no sound, it's just, <laughs> and so, uh, what you want to do, you know, it's a four-dimensional problem. The Earth's going to be at a place, the asteroid's at a place, but it's the time. You don't want the asteroid to arrive when the Earth does, and vice versa. And so, you just want to give it a little nudge, and in long, by long tradition in, in rocket science, we call that a little change in velocity, a little delta V. But you probably couldn't carry enough fuel to do that. And it's been proposed that you make a big, um, a big rocket with um, xenon in it, then you throw the xenon out the back in an ion drive, and you just, this thing is so massive, how massive is it, that it's mutual gravity with the asteroid would gently tug the asteroid off course. But uh, it's probably not feasible because of the amount of fuel you would need. It might be, but it's probably taken an extraordinary amount of xenon. Just to move this one they're talking about at, at NASA, move one that's just seven meters, which is not that big. I mean, it, it's one that would burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Just to move that one would take a sixth of the world's annual production of xenon. So, I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't be done. It's just kind of a hassle. But don't worry. We at the Planetary Society are here for you. We've been doing this thing we call the laser bees. So this would be a network, a flotilla, a space-tilla of uh, spacecraft 
that would have solar panels on them that would run lasers, then we'd zap the surface of the asteroid, except it's in outer space. And then the asteroid would ablate, would, uh, would volatile, would burn off, and uh, you'd get this jet of stuff, of ejected material, ejecta, and that would have enough momentum to push it. And uh, Alison Gibbons, the grad student in Scotland that's been working on this, she just got her PhD. Yes, Alison, way to go. Uh, she's been doing this and it works a little better than people thought. Everybody thought that the ejected material would mess up the laser, but uh, it, it works well enough. So just, just one more reason, I don't care about me, it's you um, trying to save the earth for. Now, I mention all this because it's going to be, if we do find an asteroid, it's going to be science, rocket science, and especially engineers that solve this problem. And you got to believe that it's possible. Uh, the speakers earlier were talking about the good old days of the 1960s in the space program. And what we had in the 1960s, and I was a little kid, I had nothing to do with it. We had this crazy optimism, this, this belief that you were going to get things done. And that's still very much to me in the US, in the American spirit. And I remember, well, sure, thank you, yes. I just remember delivering the Washington Post. This is back um, for the students. This, the news used to come to you on paper. <laughs> this, uh, it's made from trees and they would print. It looked just like a computer screen, but you, had, you needed reflected light. <laughs> don't worry about it. Well, don't worry about it. It's, uh, it's, it's a long time ago. Anyway, in the Washington Post, uh, they ran this story several times in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Insects which have been flying for some 350 million years defy the laws of aerodynamics. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't the same insect. I mean, just, there, yeah. Uh, the bumblebee, considering its size and shape and wingspan, is an aerodynamic misfit and should be unable to fly. But even as a little kid, I remember going out looking at the azalea bushes and looking at bees. And I realized, Wait a minute, the bees fly fine. <laughs> no, your problem there is with the theory, right? I mean, they should be unable to fly. They're flying. Get over it. <laughs> and so, well, it just, in my lifetime, it was discovered pro these two key things that bees do that nobody had really thought through back in the Ripley's Believe It or Not heydays. First of all, their bodies are like springs. They pull their abdomens tight and let them go and they get 40 or 50 <laughs> wing flaps out of every squeeze, not bad. And then they have these crazy, the, the bees are four-winged flies, they have big wings and little wings. The little wings go back up, they, they, they create some uh, whirlpool, a vortex, vortices, that the wings can get back up through, this is Bill being a bee, can get back up through uh, more easily than people thought, which greatly reduces the aerodynamic drag. So those discoveries were made in my lifetime. Just think what will be made in the next few years. You know, um, when I was young, people presumed that the big had banged, the universe uh, was expanding, and that it was slowing down. And so... Uh, because there's all this gravity, you'd have an explosion. You know, the evidence of the Big Bang is uh, Edwin Hubble's up on Mount Wilson. He sees everything moving apart. Then Fred Hoyle's on the radio one day, and he makes this offhanded remark. It's like a Big Bang, which is the coolest expression. <laughs> Except it's in outer space, which so just goes out like that. And everybody expected it to be slowing down. But 2004, Saul Perlmutter and his buddies went out to measure how much it's slowing down. And it's not slowing down. It's accelerating. And do you know why? Nobody knows why. <laughs> so the discoveries that may be made tomorrow in the next 10 years could utterly, dare I say it, change the world. And so the, this t moment in th history is fantastic. And I will claim that we are living at a time where science is cool again. I was on... Right on. 
I love you guys, I love you guys. I was on The Big Bang Theory, which is the most popular show on television. No, wait a minute, you mean the most popular sitcom? No, it's the most popular show, not just the most popular sitcom. And it's about these people who are sort of social misfits, if I may. So I, you know, fit right in. And, and I was on camera with Bob Newhart to the grown-ups here. I just got to say, I'm this close to Bob Newhart, man. <laughs> and trying to out deadpan Bob Newhart. Just, that may be physically impossible. That may be beyond the pale. So what I'm saying is we have to take this optimism. We have to take this uh, passion for science and change the world. I mean, what was, the, what was your favorite thing about your favorite professor or teacher? It was his or her passion. He, was so, he or she was so into it, right? That's what you loved. We're just, we're that close to being able to change the world. This is uh, me, actually, it's a picture of me. I'm, I'm here uh, on the roof of my house in California. I have four kilowatts of solar panels behind me. I have my uh, solar tube dome here, which has these grooves in it like Fresnel lenses like in some of these lights that direct light down this shiny tube. So it's much more efficient or there's much more light than from a conventional skylight. Because even when the sun's low in the sky, it changes direction and goes down the tube. I still go into the room below and try to turn out the light. It's going on eight years, it still throws me off. And then in the foreground is the solar hot water system right here. This is a zigzag of pipes in a box. People, it's a box. This is not rocket surgery, all right? It's plumbing. I mean, who is better at plumbing than the United States? I mean, no, but Holland. I mean, I, nobody. Come on. I want one of you out here to go into the solar hot water business and get rich. I mean, we have water, gas-powered water heaters everywhere, and we get this light from the sun for free. Let's get her done, people. Now, my watch is solar-powered. And these, I never wind it. You can't wind it. These solar panels are about 10% efficient. These are maybe 15% efficient. What if they were 30% efficient or 40 or 50 or 80% efficient? It would change the world. And what if you were the person who invented it or you were the venture capitalist who invested in it or you're the attorney that allows the intellectual property to be protected so that everybody can get rich and change the world? Let's go, people. This technology exists. Just think of the stuff we haven't thought of. Wait a minute. What I mean is, think of stuff we haven't thought of. So if we had wind and solar, have you heard that the wind blows around here? You probably haven't noticed. Anyway, we have wind all morning and every night. Then we have solar panels during the day. Then I drive an electric car. I drive a Nissan Leaf. You put electricity into it, you drive around. In the same way people know where all the toilets are gonna flush during this halftime, People know where all the cars are. Engineers know where all the cars are. At the shopping mall in the night, they're at the school during the day, they're at the factory in the morning. Okay, so we'd store the electricity in everybody's car and send it to everybody. And then if you wanna get rich, people, invent the better battery. People are experimenting with the hot metal battery. This is where you have molten metal on the bottom and top is the electrodes. The more electricity you pump into them, the hotter they get and they become molten. It's a layer of magnesium and a layer of salt, like table salt, and then a layer of antimony or antimony. It's next to tin on the periodic table. You pump electricity into it and this, you store it. So then in the basement of every building like this, of every dorm, at the end of every city block, we'd have these batteries and we'd put the electricity from the sun and wind in there and we just wouldn't need to burn everything. And so then we'd have a smart grid, which you were gonna develop, and we can send that on nanotube carbon wire transmission lines all over North America. Would you get it done? So uh, I met Rick Smalley, who discovered buckyballs, Buckminster Fullerenes, and he said it's like the electron falls asleep at one end of the nanotube, has a dream, <laughs> and wakes up at the other end with virtually no electrical resistance. I mean, we're that close. We're that close, people. I want you to figure this out. 
Now, I went to the, uh, do you know the most popular museum in the world is in the United States? It's the Air and Space Museum. It's more popular, more visitors every year than the Louvre, which is, to me is amazing. And that's me, well, I mean, picture me. And uh, there in the foreground is the Mars dial, which is this thing made for getting the colors right in the pictures on Mars. It's the photometric calibration target. But we also messed with it to make it tell time on Mars with shadows, an important task. <laughs> Yes, I was in a meeting trying to convince people how great this would be. No, we can tell time on Mars with shadows. Great, Bill. That's great. That's really good. It's a space program, man. Well, Bill, do you speak Klingon? No, it'll be cool. Come on. So if you go to Mars, uh, this, is the, uh, this is the Opportunity rover. Down in the bottom here is the Mars dial. Uh, it looks like that and it has a message to the future. This is the first message to the future on a spacecraft since the 1970s, since the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, Pioneer before that and then Voyager had messages to the future for somebody out there to get. But this is on Mars, and it's very reasonable to me that somebody in here, I just heard his or her voice a few moments ago, uh, will go to Mars and walk around. And in this, on the edge of the Mars dial, in these little letters, it says to those who visit here, which is inherently optimistic, somebody's gonna come here, right? To those who visit here, we wish a safe journey and the joy of discovery. And that, my friends, is the essence of this business. That is the essence of science. That is what drives us. That's why there's so many skulls in that picture is our ancestors were driven to make discoveries. If you meet somebody who doesn't want to discover anything, you will outcompete him or her at everything. Ping pong, uh, pong. <laughs> it's an older reference. Um, um, Grand Theft Auto 16 or whatever it is now. You will outcompete him or her because you want to experience that joy of discovery. That is why we do science. That is why we get up and come to work every day. And it is what is going to, dare I say it, change the world. Now, this is a picture of Saturn, and it was put into the Library of Congress in November along with Carl Sagan's papers. And if you look closely, there's Saturn, uh, the main part of the planet in the upper left, and there are the rings being illuminated by sunlight from above and glowing and gorgeous. But right here, this dot, which is a few pixels, is the Earth. That's the whole thing. That's everybody. If we go up there about 100,000 kilometers or so, uh, we get the same view. Uh, there's the sun, and there's the Earth right there. That's it. That's everybody who's ever lived. That's every oak tree. That's every squid. That's every beetle. Even my old boss, apparently, <laughs> is from there. And uh, when I was in third grade, Mrs. Cochran told us there are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on the beach. And I just remember thinking, Mrs. Cochran, have you ever been to a beach? I mean, <laughs> lady, there is a lot of sand. I'm not kidding. I grew up, you know, back east, we'd go to Delaware, and you look that way, the first state, the Diamond State, 1,000 nautical miles, 1,500 nautical miles, there's just nothing but sand. Lady, like, no. I would not have expressed it in this way, but Mrs. Cochran, are you high? <laughs> That's impossible. But apparently, it's true. I mean, there's a lot of sand, sure. I mean, the tide goes out, there's more sand. You shuffle your feet and there's sand. You look behind you, there's sand, 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 sand. Little grains of sand everywhere. But there are apparently more stars than all of that. And so I was a kid. I was uh, eight years old. And I'm thinking, I am nothing. I mean, when you look at it like this, you cannot see little Bill standing on the beach. Little Bill is just like a grain of sand. He's just another speck on that dot. So I started to feel bad. 
I mean, I'm just a speck with these other specks, which are in turn part of a speck, which orbits the sun, which is a completely unremarkable star. There's nothing special about our sun. I'm a speck on a speck orbiting a speck with a bunch of other specks in the middle of specklessness. I suck. But with your brain, which is only this big, in the case of my old boss, of course, quite a bit smaller, but with your brain, you can know all of this. With your brain, you can use the process of science to make discoveries about the world and our place in space. With your brains, we can innovate. We can experience the joy of discovery, and we can, dare I say it, change the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I love you guys. Thank you. So, oh wow, thank you. I love you guys. Oh wow, this is really nice, you guys. Oh wow, oh okay, God. <laughs> All right, people. All right, people. <laughs> Thank you all. We have time for questions, or did I blow it? Not quite. You didn't quite blow it. I'm sorry. Uh, well, maybe <laughs> next time. All right. Uh, we do have a limited amount of time for questions, and you will notice that there are microphones uh, down here in the aisles. We've got about 25 minutes. Good. Okay, go. Sir. Thank you. Oh, no, it is we who must thank you. No. Um, first, uh, so regarding your debate with Ken Ham. Oh, that old thing? Yes. That old thing, yeah. Um, all the science blogosphere said, Bill kicked, and there are children here, so I won't say what empanage. you kicked. Empanage? Um, Anybody empanage? <laughs> Fuselage? Uh, <laughs> Fuselage is the shaft of an arrow. We write with a pen. Penna is Latin for a feather. We used to have quills. So the empanage are the tail feathers of an arrow, the fletching on an arrow, or I think people have empanages. Yes, kicked empanage. Thank you. Well, actually, we don't. We don't have feathers, but that's okay. We don't have empanages? We don't have feathers. I, I know, but, uh, <laughs> sir, I don't know what your relationship... I mean, I, I, I don't want to go too far TMI. in this, but I really like women. Yeah. TMI? Yeah, yeah. yeah well, okay, not, yeah. so anyhow, uh, shortly thereafter, after everyone said you won... Ken Ham got on and said, yeah, he won, but I got a lot of money out of it. So, And to what that is point, your response to here's that? Here's my response. And I've thought about uh, publishing this, but so I tweeted um, that they claimed that they got funding for that, their next extraordinary idea, which is an ARC park, where they're going to make a model of the ARC uh, that doesn't float. It'll... <laughs> Uh, anyway, they claimed that they got their funding before, before that. But I, I tweeted, Ark Park got funded, question mark. Where did it come from, and did they meet the deadline? Because they had not met the deadline for their funding before February 4th. Then all of a sudden they did, and there's a judge from Grant County, Kentucky, on the board. So we'll see. As soon as I tweeted that, within hours, I got an email from uh, Mark Loy, who's the head guy, who said, oh, no, we met the deadline. Everything's fine. We met the deadline. So we'll see. We'll see. To that point, we'll see. But my strong hope and belief, and this is what I say all the time when I get angry letters from all of you uh, about anything. No, there's an error in the old dinosaur show, and I'm sorry. It was about potassium and argon. I'm sorry about that. It was 20 years ago. And... Uh, <laughs> And one time, if you go to my Wikipedia page, I said cesium when I meant cadmium. I'm sorry. <laughs> it happens at six in the morning, and you gotta get up at five to go to CNN, okay. Um, anyway, to that point, which I had, um, you may be right. 
That's what I write to all of you. You may be right, but I think because of the World Wide Web, that footage of that debate will be out there a long time, and we'll see if that eventually runs that uh, out of business. That's an excellent question. Thank you. Second question, will, uh, you, dance? will, you, will you dance for us? No. <laughs> no. No. I mean, I might uh, if everything were different. Yeah. <laughs> And by the way, disappointed, Tyne's not coming back. She's not even in the uh, chorus, in the, my partner. Uh, she, she is all that. I mean, these people are just amazing, you guys. They're professional athletes. They're, they choreograph. It's really something. This is going to be a big season. I met Meryl and Charlie, the ice dancers, who won gold medals. I'm rooting for them. It's going to be cool. I know you all watch Dancing with the Stars. It's a TV show. I'm sorry. I see the, the students here. What? There's what? Yeah. Uh, so, over here. Yes. Uh, hi. So, um, I'm a philosopher. Uh, as it turns out, I'm a oh, philosopher. Oh, do you know? Uh, yeah. Um, Go ahead. Uh, actually, as it turns out, I'm a philosopher of science. And I'm also very, very interested in um, communicating information to non-experts. And so I wanted to know uh, what, you th what work you thought philosophy could do in help spreading um, you know, scientific literacy and what philosophical problems, or what scientific problems you think that, science, or that philosophy could help solve. Well, hang on. How many people have PhDs? There must be dozens. So it's the doctor of philosophy. That's what they get. I mean, piled higher and deeper, I understand that, but <laughs> you're a doctor of philosophy. Uh, so, one of the fundamental things about science, which to me is philosophical, and I know you guys get in big arguments about this and it's a huge party for you, but can you really know anything? You can't prove that the sun's gonna come up tomorrow. Well, you kinda can. And so, to me, one of the deep philosophical aspects of science is that we believe that we can learn about nature. We can discover it. And I know you guys argue about that. Um, I mean, more power to you. And it turned out, this Aristil Aristotelian idea that if a tree falls in the forest, it does, does it make a sound? Is either, I mean, obviously it makes a sound from a science standpoint, obviously. But it turns out, in a philosophical sense, right, the observer affects the outcome. If you do experiments to get the particle to go this way or that way, whether or not there's an observer affects it, apparently. Do, 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 do. So please carry on the work of philosophy. And then uh, I would say the ultimate thing I'd like everybody to appreciate for me where philosophy and science interlock intimately is we are made of the stuff of the dust of exploding stars. So we are, as Carl Sagan so eloquently stated, we are at least one way that the universe knows itself. And so that for me, for, and I know for a lot of people, it's very troubling. What do you mean? We're made of dust. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but it also fills me with reverence. That's amazing. It's also, for me, gives you a responsibility. We're part of the universe. Let's take care of it. Let's take care of our little corner. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, so I know science is getting a lot more popular with shows like Cosmos and the Big Bang Theory. And we've got a lot of programs, including this one, teaching scientists how to talk to the public. But what are some of the things that we can do to teach the public to talk to scientists, to sort of promote the science literacy among people? Uh, get her done. Let's see, how to promote science literacy among people is get in arguments in the, at the coffee shop, uh, discussions. And... Uh, <laughs> My big thing is, you know, when did, when did you want to get excited about anything? I mean, when did they, we did a study, or we were given studies that were very compelling back in the 1990s. Uh, we aimed the Science Guy show at people 10 years old and younger because there was very compelling evidence that 10 years old is as old as you can be to get the lifelong passion for science. But I think it's as old as you can be to get a lifelong passion for anything. Uh, I know there's a bunch of journalists here, journalists. Yeah, when did you want to tell stories? I mean, since you were a little, little kid, right? And so uh, I think it's very, uh, what we would like to have in the U.S. is a big emphasis on elementary science education. And I claim that it's not, that it's not expensive. Well, thank you. 
It's easy to say, but if you have people who are diligently saying Bill Nye's a liar for presenting, for showing that there's trees in California that are older than this guy thinks the earth is, I mean, uh, you really, we're up against it. So elementary science, I think, is a huge opportunity for us as taxpayers and voters. And the other thing I would like to change, strangely enough, is algebra. I think, I, no, it, apparently algebra is the single best indicator, not cause, it's not clear if it's cause and effect, but the indicator of whether or not you pursue a career in science or engineering is whether or not you embraced algebra. So I think we just gotta start teaching algebra a little sooner in school and have not put so much pressure on people when they're, I'm not trying to freak you out. <laughs> Everything in this room owes its existence to somebody's understanding of algebra, okay? It's not a bad thing, it's just how it is. That's a great question, so vote. That's what I, I say to people who don't wanna vote, oh, it doesn't make any difference. Well, why don't you just shut up? But, <laughs> but they don't, so you gotta vote. Yes, sir, Snapple. Thank you. Um, now, what is it like having been a just the, the face of science for like an entire generation who grew up watching your kind of shows and learning about science and getting a passion for science, like kind of being, I guess, a science rock star to some people. Like, thank you. Like, what's that like? It's cool. <laughs> but I will tell you, I don't get it. I, I'm serious, I try to get it. I mean, I'm walking through the airport, I go to a coffee shop and people, I love you, man. And once in a while, I hate you, you suck, but most people <laughs> uh, really watch the show and they got a lot of, I take it you were one of them. Oh yeah. And I really appreciate it. I mean, it's wonderful. I just uh, trying to get the PB and J, the passion, beauty, and joy across to everybody of science. But I will also say we're not quite done. All right, I'm still waiting for you guys to change the world. I want the better battery, I want, the big thing I want you all to do is raise the standard of living of women and girls around the world. And uh, that's very easy to say in one sentence, but it's quite difficult to do, because when we raise the standard of living of women and girls especially, then the world's population will go down in a controlled fashion, and the quality of life for everybody will be much higher. And so, Put it another way, if you only have men involved in the process of science, which was pretty much true in my grandfather's day, from near as I can tell, uh, then you're gonna have half as many brains working on problems. So you just, come on, let's go. Uh, and I remind the ladies, everybody, my mother, this is not somebody I've heard of, my mother could not get an American Express card because she was Mrs. Nye. Even though at that time she had a master's degree and she went on to get a doctorate, uh, you were, even when I was a teenager, you know, working at summer jobs, or whatever, my mother was furious, I remember slamming down the phone because she was the wife of somebody rather than being considered a breadwinner herself. So ladies, I say to you, it wasn't that long ago and it was not the good old days. So we gotta, at some level, export that way of thinking to the developing world. It's a big challenge. Whew, that's a great question. Thank you. Yes, over here. So I have a two-part kind of. So one, what motivated you most to get into science? Was it a teacher or? I don't remember, and I'm not kidding. It was before I was three years old. And I think I put the bee thing up because it's deep within me. I remember sitting there watching bees, and this is in the city of Washington, D.C., my mom had azalea bushes in the front yard. And I got to the point where I thought I was watching the same individual, the same girl bee coming and going. By the way, all the bees you see are girls, are females. Woe bees. Uh, the, uh, the guys are confined to the hive. It's, I mean, it sounds like it's a pretty good gig, but you don't get out. Um, anyway, and I remember thinking that Ripley's Believe It or Not thing was really compelling for me. Like, what's going on? How can this be... Uh, do this, and then I remember playing cards on the front porch and sort of swatting a bee. My brother had a chemistry set. This is in the old days when they were dangerous and cool. 
and he would routinely make ammonia. That was one of his favorite little things. <laughs> and he made it in my hand. And then I got stung by a bee, which really, I didn't get it till I, I mean, man, that is not, I'm not a fan of that, you know. And then they put ammonia on the wound. And I went, whoa, there's like a connection, man. Like, whoa. That was very compelling. It was a long time ago. And my second part, you're going to judge me. But can I get a high five? Yeah, you get a high five, yeah. <laughs> cool. nice. Why would I judge her? I was a five Yes, skirt person. Hi. Um, number one, thanks for teaching me that I can hang upside down and drink water still. Yes. <laughs> and the other thing, this classic is grapes. They're, they're, they're good. <laughs> um, uh, and also, thank you for touching on women in science. That was actually my original question, but I had another as a backup. Um, I know, right? Uh, so I'm wondering how you deal with the frustrations of talking to people that don't really want to learn about science. Like, um, I, I, I work in an area where people say if they don't agree with you, then there's nothing that you can really do to kind of uh, change their mind if they're really set in their ways. That's so, so how do you, are, do you get really frustrated sometimes or, or how do you kind of look at that whole aspect? In my opinion, which is correct. Of course. Uh, <laughs> you have to accept that people aren't going to get what you're driving at the first time. When you go challenging somebody's beliefs they've held for decades, it's not gonna, they're not gonna change their minds in a few seconds. So go into it like you've given them something to think about. Like, and then next time you see them, you know, how you, how's that going for you, the uh, 6,000 year old thing? And so <laughs> you just gotta chip away at it. And uh, I will emphasize, you know, just talking some more about in that debate is the tremendous discipline, you know, as a performer, like, dude, do, do you see what, what's going on, you know? Well, I've got this book. That, well, it's good for you. I mean, the, the trees are older than you think the earth. And so uh, uh, you just got to go into it like it's going to be a process. That's my answer. Just keep chipping away because uh, it'll sort out. You'll get her done. Yes, yes. As a young person and a student, how did you pursue the joy of discovery that you talked about? Well, I mean, I was a guy. We blew things up. I mean, <laughs> uh, I am not a shareholder or anything, but Estes rockets are still just to fill me with joy. Uh, I mean, and the smell. Oh, God, just love it. It's great. But uh, uh, the other thing I remember growing plants, sunflowers, and watching them bend to the light. That was cool. I had fish, which fascinated me. If you have a fish tank, you really, you're not gonna have time for television. <laughs> you just sit there and stare at them. It's amazing. I guess I would say I spent a lot of time observing and uh, it, my parents supported it. You know, my dad always called himself Ned Nye, boy scientist, even though he was a salesman. He sold advertising, he didn't work as a scientist. And, uh, oh, by, by the way, very proud to say, my mother, you know, was recruited by the U.S. Navy because the, well, the family myth is she was good at math and science, and she worked on the Enigma code, uh, and she didn't talk about it. They couldn't talk about it. It was crazy. But I guess a respect for observation. I, I spent a lot of time looking at I still do spend a lot of time looking at things. That's a great question. Yeah. Can we take a selfie? Uh, can we not do it right now? Because it, we'll it, it just takes a lot of time. Yeah. Sorry, man. I love you more than life itself. But just wait a <laughs> sec. No, it just takes a lot of time. Yes. All right. Well, first of all, I wanted to say that um, I really appreciate all the work you've ever done. Yes. <laughs> Even the stuff I screwed up. <laughs> Anything. <Cool>. Yes. <laughs> uh, first saw you 16 years ago in my elementary school. I'll never forget the day I almost wet myself. <laughs> Wow. I was like, this sure. guy is full of energy. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so my, qu yeah. my yeah. question is, if there's one thing that you can ever have as a legacy to yourself that you can put upon you know, everyone here to future generations, what is that? Besides, besides change the world, I've got that in my mind. Oh, right on. Uh, 
um, the passion, beauty, and joy, the joy of discovery. Pursue the joy of discovery. That would be, that would be the greatest thing. If you invented the better battery, I would love that. <laughs> if you cured nominally cancer, that would be really good. If you found a way to uh, educate women and girls in the developing world at a reasonable cost that everybody got excited about, that'd be really good. Uh, but in the meantime, <laughs> let's go for the joy of discovery. I hope you experience the joy of discovery. And then can I have a selfie with you after? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Let's do it after, yeah. Um, you know, it just takes a surprising amount of time, you guys. I don't mean to be dismissive. It's, it's funny. So then, um, uh, when you go exploring, this is what I was going to say, two things are going to happen. You will make discoveries, even if it's your, maybe most especially if it's your backyard, you will make discoveries. But the other thing is you will have an adventure. So I hope you have an adventure. That's what there. Thank you. I hope the joy of discovery gives you an adventure. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm Just, proud to say that I'm finally graduating this May to become a high school biology teacher. Right on. Right on. But I, as everyone else in here, knows that science can be challenging. Um, what would you give advice to me to give to my future students about the challenges of science? Be passionate. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because that's what will make, that's what will engage the students. Go in there to the extent possible uh, that you're excited about every day and you can't wait for them to nail this test and do a fabulous job and find out what the Krebs cycle. And <laughs> still a mystery why plants reflect all that green light. Uh, get in there and uh, let your passion come through. That would be my advice. I, I'm going to, um, unfortunately, elicit some passion, passion here. Uh, oh, my gosh. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> uh, just briefly, for some of the older people in the audience, White Fang. Yeah, okay. So I'll just tell you, there's a guy named Soupy Sales, a comedian from my time. And he had this, it was a TV show, and you'd have lunch with him every day. And there'd be a door, and, he'd, and the, there'd be a knock on the door, and he'd open the door, and there was a, a dog named White Fang. But all you saw was the, hand, the paw. And it was some guy, it was some guy with his hand doing this. <laughs> but since the guy was a guy, he would be a giant dog. So Soupy Sales would talk to him like this, because he's a giant dog, and the paw is right here. And White Fang would say things like, <coughs> and then Soupy Sales would say, your car broke down? <coughs> the spark plug wires? And it was funny. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry I had to, that came out. Uh, <laughs> But White Fang's signature thing was, oh yeah? So what's your question? Um, I actually have two. One is, what inspired you to create your show? I've tried to change the world. <laughs> and I had two people I worked with, Jim McKen and Aaron Gottlieb. They still live in Seattle. They mostly work at Microsoft, uh, freelance. But the, we wanted to make science videos to get people excited about science. We wanted to tell stories on television. You know, as my old professor Carl said so often, and I hope you experience this the rest of your life, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And so it's just within you, you want to share this excitement. So that's what made me want to do the show. That's the first question, second one. Um, could I have a high five? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cool. Yes. Bow tie guy. He just asked my question. He just asked your question? Oh. All right, Hobie man. Uh, this doesn't have to do with science, but what's your favorite color? Um, my favorite color is green. Most people say green. But uh, with that said, I'm, I like orange. <laughs> and uh, I'm especially fond of yellow. So I, what I prefer to say is don't make me pick. I mean, how could you appreciate one color if you didn't have all the others, you know? Yeah. And Crazy. Can I have a high five? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. Yes. 
It's not especially hygienic, just be careful. <laughs> yes, bow tie guy, yes, looking very sharp. Hello, um, uh, so I'm kind of interested in neurons. Neurons, yes. I use a few. And uh, biology major and working in neuroscience lab, etc. How can I, as a young person, learn the communication skills necessary for doing what you do? I don't know, man. <laughs> I will say that in my family, comedy or jokes were valued. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was important to be funny, as well as what, everybody? Fashion. No, funny looking. Huh? <laughs> huh? It's that simple, see? So uh, when you make it funny, then people will get along with you. You know, by the way, to change it back again to that debate, I blew off a minute and a half telling a joke, if you watch it. Oh, my goodness. I, I, uh, I my really, colleagues I have, would never do that. So we're done? I ha yeah, we got to go? I have to be a bad guy. I'm really sorry. All right, you are a bad guy. Thank you all so much. I'm sorry, you guys. Thank you. Let us change the world. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.